Hello again all! Welcome back to the Knowledge Tower, where we investigate the science behind the Bionicle legend. In today's investigation, we continue with the third instalment in our series exploring the details of the Solis Magna star system. In part one, we looked at whether Solis Magna was a one star system or if it was a binary, ultimately settling on a binary system made up of the stars Solis A and Solis B. Then, in part two, we took a closer look at Solus A, determining that it was specifically a K-type or orange dwarf star, with the spectral type of K4V. If you haven't watched those videos yet, I'd recommend starting with them before continuing with this investigation, as we will be building upon them going forwards. As with last month, I've put the links to the videos in the description below and the card above. Now, let's get on with part three. In this video, we will bring Solus B back into the fold, determining its own stellar type, figuring out its orbit alongside Solus A, and ultimately investigate how all of this ties together to affect the experiences of the inhabitants of the system. When it comes to figuring out what type of star Solus B is, I think the same criteria can be applied to what we did for Solus A. For that part of the investigation, we used the mission of Matanui and the fact that the GSR never left the Solus Magna system to infer that the system as a whole should have the potential to host as many habitable planets as possible, using that to narrow down the search to orange dwarf stars. Following this line of reasoning, I think that Solus B should be an orange dwarf as well, allowing for the same wide, stable habitable zone for it to host its own habitable planets that the GSR could visit. Going back to the graph from last time, there are two islands of stability within the orange dwarf mass range, equating to the K4V and K7V spectral types. We chose K4V for Solus A, so let's go with K7V for Solus B to allow some variety within the system. That makes Solus B smaller than Solus A, with a correspondingly lower luminosity and narrower habitable zone, but one that can still host some habitable planets for Matanui to study. Now that we have selected the characteristics of Solus B, we need to investigate how the two stars would interact with one another gravitationally. When we think of two bodies that are gravitationally bound to one another, we normally think of whichever one is smaller orbiting around the one that is larger. The moon orbiting the Earth, for example. However, this does not actually tell the whole story. Taking that Earth-Moon example, we think of the Earth sitting still relative to the Moon and that the Moon is moving around the Earth, with the centre of the Moon's orbit being the same as the centre of the Earth. While this works if we only consider the effects of the Earth's gravity upon the Moon, this actually ignores the smaller but still noticeable effect that the Moon has upon the Earth. When taking the gravity of both bodies into account, Instead of the Moon orbiting around the centre of a stationary Earth, both bodies in fact orbit around a mutual centre point known as the barycenter. The barycenter represents a point in space that is the exact centre of the combined mass of the system, in this case the mass of the Earth and the Moon. It is actually around this point that the whole system orbits, rather than the centre of the Earth. In the case of the Earth and the Moon, the large disparity between the masses of the two means that the barycenter is actually still located inside of the Earth. This means that from the outside, the Moon appears to orbit around the Earth, while the Earth itself appears to wobble slightly as it moves around the barycenter, like this. However, in examples where the mass difference between the two bodies is less pronounced, the barycenter can in fact be outside of the surface of both bodies, and instead exist in a point in space between them. The orbits of the dwarf planet Pluto and its moon Charon are a good example of this. Charon is only slightly smaller than Pluto, with the resulting barycenter of the two bodies being in between them, causing both to orbit around a shared point in space, like this. In this example, the masses are similar, though Pluto is ultimately still the more massive of the two, meaning that the barycenter is closer to Pluto than that of its moon. However, in systems where the two bodies are roughly the same in terms of mass, the barycenter is located directly in between them, like in this example. It is important to note here that there isn't actually anything physical at the barycenter that they are orbiting around. It is simply the point in space that happens to be the centre of their combined gravitational influence. Because of this, stable orbits of this type always have their respective bodies in opposite positions in their orbits, as has been shown in these animations. Returning to our stars, 
these different examples of how orbits can look can also apply to solace A and solace B in exactly the same ways. With the position of the barycenter, and therefore how the stars appear to orbit around each other, being different depending upon their relative masses. The shape of the orbits themselves can also vary. The example animations shown so far all have circular orbits, meaning they have low eccentricity. Eccentricity is a measure of how elliptical an orbit is, with lower eccentricity meaning more circular orbits and higher eccentricity meaning more elliptical orbits. As you can see, the level of eccentricity in the star's orbit can greatly affect how the orbit looks. For our investigation going forward, I will assume a very low eccentricity for the orbits of Solace A and B, assuming circular orbits for them both. This is mainly to help with the stability of the planets within the system, as higher eccentricities of the stars would add a varying gravitational tug on the orbits of any planets, leading them to become less stable over time. Orbital period, or how long it takes the stars to complete their orbit around the barycenter, can also vary massively between binary star systems. Some, like AMCVN type binaries, can orbit each other in as little as an hour, while the orbits of the Proxima Centauri Alpha Centauri system take many hundreds of thousands of years to do the same. Let's take a look at what we know so far and see if we can determine these characteristics for our stars. When looking at the requirements for the planets within a binary system that we covered in part one, we noted that Spherus Magna would most likely be in an S-type orbit within the system, orbiting Solace A but not Solace B. For S-type orbits to be stable, the planet needs to orbit within about one-fifth of the closest approach of the other star in the binary. Otherwise, the gravitational interactions of that second star could destabilise it, potentially ejecting the planet from the system entirely. We want the full habitable zone to be stable, as well as potentially some other planets further out to fill out the system. So let's say that one-fifth equals double the outer edge of the habitable zone, just to be safe. Given that we calculated the outer edge of the habitable zone to be a little over 91 billion metres away from Solace A, that puts the distance between our two stars at approximately 916 billion metres, or around 6 astronomical units. Now that we know that, we can use this equation to work out the location of the barycentre. Plugging in the numbers, we get a barycenter that is around 428 billion metres away from Solace A, or around 46% the total distance between the two stars. As expected, given that Solace A is more massive than Solace B, the barycenter is located closer to it, giving them an orbit around it like this. Knowing this, we can now use this next equation to work out how long a full orbit would take for the stars. Because these stars orbit a barycenter, which, again, is simply a point in space rather than a physical object, they actually take the same amount of time to complete one orbit as each other, despite being different distances away from the barycenter. This is different from other examples, like, say, multiple moons orbiting a planet, whose orbital periods vary depending on their distances from the host planet. Once again, plugging the numbers into our equation, we end up with an orbital period of just under 13 years for both Solace A and Solace B around their shared barycenter. So, there we have it. We have determined the stellar type for both Solace A and Solace B, how far away they both are from each other and from their shared barycenter, and how long it takes for them to complete one full orbit of one another. But right now, this is all just pure numbers. What we really want to see is what all this means from the perspective of life on Spherus Magna. So let's do a few more calculations to give some real context to these numbers. In order to do that though, we need to give a fixed value for the orbital distance of Spherus Magna around Solace A. In previous parts of this series, I've simply determined the range of distances in which Spherus Magna could orbit and left it at that, but now we need a more concrete number to move forward. In the end, I chose an orbital distance of around 0.56 AU away from Solace A for the orbit of Spherus Magna. Deciding on this, and giving the reasons why, deserves a full video to itself. One that I have coming soon for you all. But for now, please just trust me that the maths checks out and we can use that answer for what we need for now. Using this equation, we can use what we know to calculate the apparent magnitude of both stars. Apparent magnitude is a measure of how bright an object appears to be to an observer at a given distance, with lower numbers meaning brighter objects. 
By working this out here, we can see how bright the light of the stars would be compared to that that we receive from the Sun here on Earth. Using the figures for Solus A, we can see that it gives an apparent magnitude of negative 26.36. This is similar to that of our Sun as seen from the Earth, with its figure being at negative 26.74. The really interesting figure, though, is the apparent magnitude of Solus B. When using its characteristics, the equations give us an apparent magnitude of negative 20.61, or approximately the brightness of the Sun as seen from the orbit of Uranus. To put this into context, during the part of Spherus Magna's orbit that puts Solus B on the nighttime side of the planet that we discussed in part 1, the light of Solus B would illuminate the ground with roughly the same light levels as you would see at sunrise or sunset here on Earth. This means that in this model, Spherus Magna would never truly experience the full dark of night for around half of its year, similar to the conditions in the Arctic and Antarctic circles during their respective summers. As one of the last calculations for this video, we can use this equation to see how large Solus A and B would appear in the sky to the Magnans, and once again compare that to our view of the Sun for additional context. When astronomers want to measure the apparent sizes of objects in the sky, they divide the sky up into units called degrees, with the view from horizon to horizon being a full 180 degrees. Each degree is then subdivided into 60 arc minutes and then again into a further 60 arc seconds. To an observer here on Earth, the Sun has a diameter of 0.5 degrees. Plugging in the numbers for our two stars, we get a diameter of 0.95 degrees for Solus A and 0.06 degrees for Solus B. Or, to put it another way, Solus A would appear 1.9 times larger in the sky for a magnum than our Sun does for us here on Earth with Solus B appearing only around 0.1 times the size of the Sun. Although its size would actually fluctuate by around 10% over the course of the year, as the orbit of Spherus Magna brings the planet closer and then further away from Solus B. Going back to our thoughts from part 1, this apparent size difference between the two stars certainly adds to the reasoning as to why only Solus A would be referred to as a Sun by the Magnans. So, it's been a long road, but three videos later, we have a full understanding of the characteristics and orbital mechanics of the Solus Magna star system. I hope you enjoyed taking this journey with me, and I'll leave you with one final visual, a sped up animation of the orbits in full, as simulated in Universe Sandbox using all of the numbers we calculated in this series. I hope you will join me next time for yet more Bionicle Science investigations here at the Knowledge Tower.